good evening everyone welcome to inget zoom series uh, 25 today our guest is defne akinci midas defne hocam has been with the department of basic english at middle east technical university for more than 25 years yes she doesn't show it i know <laughs> She completed her master's degree at the University of Manchester, United Kingdom on ELT and computer assisted uh, language learning. Uh, she's working on her PhD thesis at the moment on educational technology. Currently, she is the coordinator of the research and development unit at METU. Her interest uh, areas include L2 motivation, language assessment, and acceptance of educational technology. This evening, her session uh, title is, in parentheses, how can we motivate beginner level young adults? Uh, this topic was suggested by you guys and Defna Hocam has kindly accepted to give a talk on this topic. So thank you very much, Defna Hocam, uh, for being our guest and for covering this very important topic for us. Welcome again, and the screen is all yours. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I hope everybody can hear me well. Yes? Okay. Uh, now, as you can see, I uh, put up a cheeky kind of title. In the title, uh, I have two questions, but one question implies uh, the other one. And you can also uh, guess even the answer. So can we motivate beginner level young adults? And I mean, of course, yes. And that's how, why I put a how there, right? Um, also, in this title, you can also um, see that I entered the answer. We motivate them. How can we motivate them? The teachers motivate them. So um, this is the shortest uh, ever webinar you've been to. Perhaps this is the uh, short, very short, concise version. They can be motivated how by teachers. I've got a little bit of a longer version which is actually the very last slide, and I'm going to show it now. Let's move on, if I can. Oh, yes, okay. Well, in a nutshell, what I'm going to talk about and what I'm going to get to uh, is a few things um, to keep in mind. And these are maybe a little bit mm, hard, just like this shell. Let's see. Well, teachers are the main source of motivation. And we, we knew this, right? But unfortunately, as I read it in, in, in a few of the articles, they are also the main source of demotivation in language learners most of the time. I'm going to give some examples of why and how we can avoid this as well. Uh, this is probably not you know, on purpose. We're trying to push the students to actually study, learn, and use English. Nobody in their right mind as a teacher would try to demotivate learners, but incidentally, without knowing, apparently we're doing it, which is uh, something we don't want. So the same motivational strategy may not be suitable or fruitful for all students. Age levels make a difference, level, even gender, as I read it, culture. Culture is a very important uh, topic, location, the purpose of learning the language. I mean, if you're an ESP student, your uh, the kind of mo sources of motivation would be different from the kind of um, in a language course for uh, uh, touristic purposes would be totally different. And um, we need to be adventurous, maybe, in trying out our strategies, and then quite picky when we're using them in the classroom. Um, different students need different strategies. So you have 20 students in a class, or in my class, in my case, 20, 21, 22. So you might have to use a, quite a lot of them because one thing may work with one student, one thing, another thing may work with another one. 
All right. Much of the learning happens outside the classroom. This is, um, this is kind of a, a downer for as a teacher. You try very hard. You do uh, all sorts of things in the classroom. And you know what? Much of the learning happens outside the classroom. Of course, the initial stage in the classroom is very important. They learn a few things, but then when they're, at, when they're at home, over the weekend, maybe even after our course is finished, they start learning. Everything sinks and they go, aha, now I get it. And sadly, we, we may not see that happening, but that's the best thing that can happen to students. How can we get them to continue learning outside the classroom? Um, let me move this aside, okay. Now, we want long-term motivation, even after the class is over, just as I said. Um, the short-term motivational strategies work mainly towards a pleasant classroom atmosphere and good classroom discipline. We know these short-term motivational strategies, being a good teacher, um, let, you know, allowing students to enjoy allowing, getting the students to enjoy the, the, the language, the, the tasks that we give them, getting them to be alert, you know, seeing them engaged in our tasks, you know, that also is motivation for us, but that uh, for them to stay in the class, enjoy the lesson, enjoy and like the, this teacher, that doesn't always necessarily mean that they're motivated to use language outside, use and practice language outside the classroom that may not be directly related to the language, but just related to the lesson. And we want both of them, not one of them. So uh, this is a longer version, <laughs> a little bit longer version of the session. Now I'm going on to the really longer session in which I'm going to uh, suggest some ways to uh, let this happen, uh, uh, um, not demotivate motivate the students, but motivate them in the long run. So let me go over the outline a little bit because um, normally I'm just like the guy on the left. Um, my thinking style is like that, but I have to go uh, try to make it like the one on the right, right? I'm going to talk about the context that I'm in because mainly I'm going to be referring to them. That's how I learned. Um, how motivation works. And from there, uh, we might want to, maybe towards the end or in the middle, you may ask, want to ask questions because your context will be different. Uh, we may want to uh, talk about other stuff with, uh, with different uh, relating to different contexts. And then I'll go over definitions of terms or maybe some description as they uh, relate to L2 motivation. And then, local findings and observations that I made. Um, findings, uh, what do I mean by that? The, the research we conducted in our case, uh, we do program evaluation uh, very frequently and we get to talk to students as well as uh, get them, getting them to uh, fill in uh, surveys and questionnaires. Every now and then, uh, issues relating to L2 motivation comes out and we learn quite a lot from that and I'll suggest strategies, and then uh, there'll be time for a question and answer. So let's go on to my context. This is what it looks like. This is a beautiful picture created for this COVID-19 situation. Uh, we can't see the students. It's just, uh, we're trying to imagine that they're there. This is the Department of Basic English, and um, they're, all of them are at home and behind screens, but that's, this is what, it, they, it would look like normally. Um, it's an English medium university in my context. So uh, what happens is the students um, enter university and then they take an exam to show that, you know, they know English. And if they don't know English, well, they come to us, we teach them English. Um, what kind of students do we have? Mainly high school graduates around the age of 18. They have um, very low levels of English or low levels of English, the ones with the high levels of English, um, we, we, we do, uh, the percentage is lower usually, or they go to their departments directly. Um, they come from different provinces in Turkey, so it's a good mix. 
Um, they have little or no notion of language requirements at Metu these days. It didn't used to be like this, but more and more uh, teachers are saying, well, the, the students don't, didn't know, they say at least, they didn't know that um, the instruction would be in English at Metu. They thought English was important, but not like this. This is, which is interesting. Um, their main motivation of coming to Metu is the campus, the high standards, and the fact that it's a state university. But number one is the campus. I'm, I'm sure of that. And that's why this year they're suffering even more, sadly. Well, uh, they have a one year academic year to reach a certain level, especially the bigger beginners. When we say one academic year, we don't mean a 12 month year. It's about seven months. So can you imagine beginner and then going on to the upper levels uh, to, to getting ready to pursue your studies in an engineering department? Even I feel uh, anxious about it. They of course have a second year to reach that certain level if they can't manage it the first year, but what happens is they feel so bad. They wanna actually do it in one year. Well, this is the context. What kind of students do we have? We have young adults. They are the individuals at the age of, uh, you know, 18 to 26, but, you know, they're still counted as adolescents, teenagers. Also, they've entered adulthood, adulthood after 18. So it's just in between, right? It's a critical period of development. They are at the verge of moving from dependent to independent. What happens is they know what they want to do and they can do. They can get um, driver's licenses, they can vote, they can um, buy things that are uh, not very healthy <laughs> if they want. Uh, they can go out uh, to parties if they want and you know, you know what, what I mean. But they have little to no knowledge of their responsibilities, you know, legally and socially. So they're shocked when, when something happens, something goes wrong. Um, because it doesn't mean, you know, you, you just have a birthday, you go into your 18, you're 18 now, you don't know your responsibilities, although as teachers, I myself do this. They, I keep telling them, you should know your responsibilities, you're 18. And it doesn't happen overnight. We need to teach them. Um, unfortunately, their self-regulation skills are not full yet. Like time management, prioritizing tasks, healthy daily routines. You know, They don't eat properly. They don't sleep properly. Um, they don't manage their times properly. They're still teenagers. You know, they've got to be shown the way. Particularly this time management problem, they have a lot of difficulty getting up early in the morning. Why? Because they're playing games all night. Up until 5, 6 a.m. in the morning, they keep playing games uh, all night. We need to know how to approach these. And just telling them, now you're 18, you shouldn't do that, doesn't quite work because they're still teenagers. <laughs> okay, um, I have more um, to say. This picture is just, you know, just to remember what it would feel, look like normally, but that doesn't look like it now. Um, what they need, and let's uh, match these with motivation, they like to socialize with their peers. And now they're missing that out. So it's, it would be a good idea to have them meet, you know, do a lot of group work so that they meet each other. And um, changing these groups would be nice from one pro project to another. During the class time, maybe through breakout rooms and after the class time, to, uh, cl class time. So you can teach them to get together, meet with others, uh, discuss, you know, so that they have this socializing bit as well, a little bit. They would like autonomy, but they don't know how to use it uh, because they're 18. So they're grown and not grown at the same time. So it would be a good idea to show them how to use their autonomy. Respect their wishes, for example, like classroom discipline, when you're making uh, classroom rules, you could ask them to also suggest uh, little rules of, you know, or provide them with choices so that they have a say in it too, like in, in the classroom. Uh, they can have and observe social boundaries, which is good, but it's good to uh, also utter them because there may be some cultural differences, um, especially online. You might have uh, students who, 
in the background, you might see the sisters and brothers running around. Um, I don't know, you can uh, teach them how to, um, or tell them or find solutions together, how to have a, uh, I don't know, unobstructed uh, classes. They like to develop new skills, hobbies, and interests, which they are so open to this. So in fact, they're expecting that to happen. That's why they like the campus. You can give them these opportunities online. Everything is online. So you can give them uh, such some um, uh, research projects uh, based on their own interests, you know, keep the uh, create creative side open. Uh, they can get, you can get them to learn new hobbies, teach new hobbies to each other and get new skills at, uh, as well. Uh, they have developed a set of values, which is great. Um, they are still learning about the other values. So a lot of discussions and debates would be nice. Of course, they will have to learn to respect each other because they're also very kind of fiery, a lot of passion. Um, so uh, it's a good thing to, a uh, good place to learn these. Trying to make plans for the future, uh, they still don't know what's going to happen about the f their future, their careers, the academic and life plans. A lot of them are not sure about the programs that they're in. They, uh, they don't know what to do. It's not the place they were, they wanted to. Um, I don't know, they, they, want, they entered physics but they actually wanted to be in an engineering department and they're, you're trying to teach them English and talk, talk, talking about uh, the need in their department in which they don't wanna be in. It's such a weird feeling for them. So uh, we need to know this and you know, try to understand their feeling, maybe direct them um, saying, for example, English is going to be necessary anyways, any department and uh, help them in that way. Uh, they can be easily distracted uh, because, especially in front of the screen, uh, watching lessons and seminars and webinars like this is, I find it really hard. Um, emotionally and cognitively and for family reasons, it's really hard. So we need to keep this in mind and be a little bit compassionate and understanding and get them to actually do things as well, um, albeit just on screen, but, you know, get them to be active. Um, they keep revise and question their convictions that the, the things that they believe in, their family values, their cho choice. I just said a minute ago, I guess, uh, the whole system, you know, um, you can guide them in, uh, in them in this respect and get them to discuss things. But of course, you need to be careful because they can get passionate and they can break each other's hearts as well. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it would be a good idea to give them some uh, ways of expression, expressing themselves. Well, we have the young adults. What is it to be like to be at the beginner level? In our case, at least. The, you are the lowest level in the school. Uh, you could be a false or true beginner at the beginning of the year, but then steadily uh, the level increases, not particularly the students, <laughs> but the program's level increases definitely. You tr the students are trying to hold on to it, you know, keep their ground. And they have little or no information about the language learning classroom. We need to remember this all the time. They, they really don't have no idea why we're doing pair work, why we're doing group work, why we're getting them to, I don't know, do repeat after me. Language classrooms are really different from others. It's not a maths class. It's not a social sciences class. They don't know. So it's, it would be a good idea to teach them, you know, the value of these, why we do this and how we do it. At the beginning, it takes a lot of time, but it's worth it. Not, they're not familiar with using, for instance, bilingual dictionaries. They don't know how to use a monolingual dictionary either. You know, so uh, taking notes, how to listen to the lesson. It's, the language is so weird to them. All our methodology is, uh, we know what we're doing. They have no idea. So it would be a good idea to be patient and teach them one by one how these work in, in uh, learning the language. Um, they easy, they get, they get more demotivated very easily. Uh, they're quite fragile because you know, they know they are the, at the lowest level. They fall into kind of learned helplessness. And I'm going to give some examples about you know, their own sentences. 
So I'm going fast through, uh, through these statements. Uh, they expect high grades in exams. Oh, this is because they were actually the best students in their classes. They got into university, they got to Metro, some engineering department. I wouldn't be able to do it ever. They were always the highest, perhaps, uh, in their classes. And all of a sudden, they come to our classes. And of course, in, in language uh, and at university, you get 60 and 70, you get very happy. <laughs> it's like, you know, but these students start to cry. Um, sometimes they get really low grades and they feel so bad. We've got to really help them a little bit about how to handle this, the feeling of, you know, how, what to understand from that grade. What do I do? All right, I'm looking at the, me the messages as well. Uh, the messages are great. Okay, I will get back to them in a minute. They also find it difficult to see the relevance. Now, I'm going to mention this relevance all the time. The relevance of what they're doing in class to what they need in the future related to English language. They don't see the point. Um, you might have uh, faced very similar things saying, Hocam şimdi yani ne oluyor yani şimdi? Yani bu neyle ilgili? Çok saçma değil mi? All of a sudden they see, uh, say these things and it's, I find them very honest. And honestly, they really don't understand why we're dwelling on if type two for two hours, three hours. They, they, they go sometimes and say, what is it? Why is it so important? Let's see what motivation is, and then uh, we'll tie these all together. Uh, I checked the, the word in the etymology dictionary. I don't know if you use the etymology dictionary. Uh, it shows the origin and the history of the works. And sometimes students like it, except for, you know, I wouldn't recommend it to use it with beginner students. Uh, what happens is you teach them, you know, um, jobs, for example, teacher, driver, ER, and then uh, they say, oh, that's great, wonderful. And then father, father, uh, mother. And you say, no, that's not the case, you know, but so it's it's a heartbreaker for them. Uh, maybe pre-intermediate and intermediate levels, they love etymology uh, dictionaries and they uh, love understanding. Ah, uh, yeah, that's another one. Cooker is my favorite, somebody says here. Uh, some students are really interested in these, and uh, it's great for uh, motivation. Some students would like to go into the words. They want to study the words and study how they developed and the, the stem of it, the, the, how, the, how they, the meaning changes, um, and they get hooked. I'll, I'll use this word a lot as well, hooked. And uh, it's great when you when they find it out. You can see their uh, eyes, you know, sprinkling with anxiety, not anxiety, <laughs> happiness. They say, "Oh, find something to to study in English." So anyway, all right. When I had a look, I found these words. Th these are so long to read. I'll just show these. What attracted my attention was in bold. It's an act, and it's a process. Act. Not one act, but it's a process. So you need to be patient and wait and wait and wait. Do something, wait and wait and wait. It cooks quite for a quite long time. Another thing is, it's related to action. So if somebody is motivated, I need to see an action. They have to do something. Action, behavior, movement, doing. How does this happen? You give an, there's somebody uh, gives an incentive. It, they induce it. There's got to be a stimulus or it's got to be an inciting thing. Initiate, instill, something in, in. Stimulus is also like moving something from the in. When, you, when I read this, I remember the in and the x. Let's move on to another definition. There's the intrinsic and extrinsic. We remember uh, intrinsic is from within because you, for the sheer enjoyment of doing uh, something ex uh, and extrinsic is because of a stick or a carrot thingy. Um, this author saw L2 motivation as intrinsic and external forces that account for uh, the initiation section direction of behavior towards a goal. That's important, towards a goal. Um, but Harmer only saw one of them. 
some kind of internal drive that pushes someone to do something. Interesting. Now the external forces are out here. When I, I came across something else by Dernier, he's uh, one of the, let's say, most prominent writers and researchers of uh, motivation. He talks about demotivators when he uses the external words, the word external, specific external forces that reduce or diminish or motivational basis of behavioral intention or an ongoing action. Hmm. So what we understand, certain external forces, isn't it a coincidence, a nice coincidence, external force, you force it onto people. External forces can be pleasant, that could be a carrot, but a stick as well. I guess Dernier uh, meant the, neg the negative one, the one, the fear factor, the penalty factor. Those are actually not motivational, but demotivational, may we say. So we need to be careful. It's not um, creating anxiety doesn't really always end up in motivating people. Oh, Desi and Ryan, uh, they uh, were studying self-determination, self-determination theory, and they used the word amotivation. And this is something I find in the, in the beginner students at the beginning of the year. The relative absence of motivation it's not because of a lack of it, but rather the individuals experiencing feelings of incompetence and helplessness. We, they come to our classes, we want them to do pair work, and they're just like, uh, can we use Turkish teacher? They really don't know. It's absent. They're, they don't know whether, to, whether they like it. They don't know whether they dislike it. They have no idea. Um, that's, what, that's why a motivation is just, you know, something we need to be aware of when they first come into class. And this might take for a, take a long time, depending on the, on the, uh, on the students, really, individuals. Um, I wouldn't know how much, how long it lasts. I mean, you would need to do a lot of research on this, and I haven't done that. This is uh, minimal research and uh, of my own experience and observation, but it's something we need to keep in mind. So. In LTA motivation, I was talking about Dernier. Um, there's a lot of being said about motivation. It's a big, huge thing, intangible. We want it, but we don't know how to get it. We don't know how to give it to stu students. We try and try, and there's always uh, the, the risk of doing wrong. Anyway, Dernier wrote down uh, strategies that are so tangible and concrete. You can. Uh, take them and actually try them in class. So that's why uh, I bought the book and I read and it really helped me a lot. I found them really uh, down to earth. On page five, he says this, strictly speaking, there's no such thing as motivation. What a bummer. I felt so bad. Uh, I felt like this. Hey, this is, it says motivation on this. And then I understood why he said that. Because he says, he continues on the very same page, luckily, he says, well, motivation explains things, and these are the things that it explains. Why people want to do something, the purpose, the goal, the target, why? What do I want to reach? How hard they are going to pursue it, the grit they, may ha they might have. You, these are the words that are coming out all the time uh, in a lot of TED Talks these days, grit. That's another theory. Um, how long they are going to sustain the activity in and out of class during and after instruction. This is large enough for us to understand. This is something uh, we want. We want them to have a purpose, work hard for a long time. So choice, effort, persistence are the things uh, that we want. And I thought, eh, is that all? It's There's more to it, of course, than, than this. This is a simplistic way of explaining it. Uh, of course, when you look at that book, you might think, oh, there are a hundred uh, strategies suggested. They're not going to, uh, you're going, what you're going to do is to pick and choose according to your likes. This worked for me. I like doing this one in the classroom. But then, hey, that might be a little bit dangerous because, you know, when you catch fish, 
you uh, bait with the hook with what the fish like, not what the fisherman likes, not what I like. Uh, always keep an eye on that. We tend to do that. This is something I like. You know, we use these words. I like this very much with the students. It works very nice and I enjoy it very much. Yes, but then you might be forgetting something else that you probably don't like so much, but it might work in the classroom. So always keep that in mind when uh, there's a list of things, which I'm going to do in a minute, list of things told to you, and you're going to find out either you're not going to like them, but they might be useful, or you're going to like them, but they're not going to work. Because as we said before, um, oh, I, I just caught very nice words. Motivation equals attempt plus desire plus favorable attitudes. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, it, it may depend on one, it depends on one context to the other. So uh, we need to remember <clears throat> this. So let's go on. Our students, motivation and strategies. I'm going to try to bring them all together. When they first come in, they are beginners, low levels, but they're full of preconceptions. First, at high school, I don't know where they catch these. Um, it could be just that uh, within the culture, they develop these, or just they say these to us uh, as um, uh, an excuse. But in the end, these preconceptions leave them helpless. They are convinced about this. They tell me this. We don't have to worry about English. Uh, this is how they felt at high school. We don't have to worry about English as we're getting ready for the university exam. We can do that there. It's easy peasy. Prep school is just fun. We can just take a rest for a year there. Yata, yata geçersin. This is what so many of them, so many of them say this. Um, it's probably self-deception uh, just to uh, get to through that fun, yeah, yeah funny, isn't it? Uh, get to th get through that difficult time. Get, taking the university entrance exam is hard. Trying, testing, you know, doing tests. It must be nerve wracking, I understand. But this, this is kind of short-term motivation. If uh, for the students and Darsana Hojalara, it's great. It'll keep the students quiet, working on the tests perfectly well. But it, it is also terrible for, for the students and for us because it's not yata yata gecharsin. And they, when they find out, they really have difficulty. The learning culture, when preparing for the university exam, we understand there's this learning culture that forms and falls on our lap. And we try to fight this over two, three months and they lose this time. This is something we have to crack through motivation. Um, I don't know how. Another thing, they start the lessons and then they realize, hmm, we cannot learn English in one year. Let's have fun this year and study next year because they have uh, the, the next year. Uh, legally, they have a chance. This is learned helplessness. Or they're trying to, a psychologist said, hey, definitely, this is not learned helplessness. They're trying to save face. If you fail, it just saying, I'm not studying, so I'm failing is better than I'm studying, but I'm failing. What am I going to do? This is just saving face. They don't know how to uh, get to grips with it. That's why they're saying this. Please don't, uh, you know, she said, don't get angry at them. Don't have, you don't have an attitude. So, all right. So we need to just undo the feeling, uh, this thinking, and motivate them. Another one. Um, we have this uh, percentages going around in our talked about because every year a, a certain percentage passes. By the way, this percentage is not accurate, but you know they they use any percentage at all. Like seventy percent of us are going to fail this year, and about sixty percent are going to fail next year. So I can I'm going to fail anyway in two years. I can use this time to only enjoy the campus and my friends, and I'll go to else I'll go elsewhere. They've given up already, altogether. This is such demotivating, you know, the, telling the students, I don't know where they get these, uh, but hey, you know, this is not the way to motivate anybody. 
this may be the previous year students. I don't know who is who are talking to them like this, but you know, it's like I would say, yes, beginner students have some difficulty passing, but a certain percentage does pass do pass, and they really do well in their departments, which is true. Um, this also leads to low self-efficacy beliefs, meaning I cannot manage no matter what I do, any kind of learning uh, study skill, anything I do, I'm gonna fail, which is very hard to undo. Um, let me see if I have another one. Ah, English is not going to be useful after prep school anyway. I will do just enough to pass. Um, somehow they don't know, they don't think it's going to be useful after uh, the first year. It's just because we want to teach them English, you know, we keep them in the prep school. This is the misinformation about the future use of English. Um, so we need to really set them right, right from the beginning. You can see how hard it is to motivate them. First, we have to really set them straight and then without breaking them though. They're, that's why I was saying they're so fragile. You just can't say no, you have to study hard, blah, blah. It doesn't work that way. All right, let's see what to do. Demystify the preconceptions without demotivating them. Uh, indicate the clear purpose of learning English in the future at Meteo. Establish relevance, how language is relevance will be relevant in the future. If they have a future view about them learning English, then they will probably keep at it. Talk about the use of English in their departments. On top of that, show the lectures on video. We have lectures on video, a lot of them. Department web pages, course outline, they're all in English. And get the students to visit their own department. Usually, I would just say own department, but these days it's just the web pages. Oh, this is sad. But get the students to meet freshmen, students. And if at all, lecturers from the departments to understand how English might be useful in the future and whether they can, which uh, the answer is yes, actually, whether they can manage the, second, uh, the first year uh, with the English skills they have. Indicate the clear purpose of learning the subject at present. Um, what I mean is that, you know, you talk about, you're going to need English in the department, you're gonna read the textbooks, blah, blah. And they say, okay, why are we talking about present perfect at the moment? Have you ever eaten couscous? Have you been to America? Uh, how many uh, sisters and brothers have you got? How is it relevant to the department? You, you need to uh, show how we are building on the language, how they, they're all going to get together and be useful in the future. Otherwise, of course, sometimes it's just going to feel, you know, how is this word going to be useful to me? They will keep asking this question and, you know, uh, feel. Uh, at a loss. Talk about what is to be done to pass, not only to pass, of course, uh, and to be successful, not what to do to fail, not to fail. Um, talk about what to do to successfully learn English, not what how to avoid failing. They are really two different things. Provide them with study skills, strategies, work on self-efficacy and confidence issues. Okay, what else? Um, here, I need to, I wanna, I just added this um, because I found it really interesting. Research indicates that students can benefit from motivational strategies if they know their purpose. And it, not without them knowing, it's actually telling them that this is a motivational strategy and the purpose of it, then they benefit more. Interesting, uh, we, uh, I never did that, uh, I must admit, but this is something that made me think. Build confidence in the classroom. Uh, low levels lack the confidence, particularly uh, productive skills and related to feedback. Because whenever we say, give feedback, uh, our teachers uh, inadvertently, and sometimes I say, oh, I correct their writing all the time. I said, feedback is not only correcting mistakes, because what you mean is there have a lot of mistakes, 
and that you corrected them. Turn it around this way. Example, they have uh, written something, a letter to somebody, a paragraph, an essay, whatever you're getting them to write. Focus on the content as a reader. React or respond to the content. Treat the person as a writer. Make comments about the content. They don't have to be very long. You have 20 students if you're lucky. Some people have 40 students. Some people have 50. I don't know. So you don't have to elaborate. Be realistic. But saying, great, excellent, wonderful. These are not comments. You have to really comment to the content. Then focus on the achievements in the paper. And then show the mistakes with ways to correct them. You can use peer feedback as well. Of course, you have to train them though, how to. If you just you know, uh, you know, distribute the papers uh, between, among the, uh, the peers, they're going to make a mess of it. In fact, they might fight among each other. Who are you to correct my writing? So uh, you have to train them and get them to focus on things that they can do. You can get them to actually make comments about the content as well, to show them uh, authorship and readership. You can do the same thing with speaking. Focus on the success of the task as a listener. Comment on the content. If they're doing presentations, if they're doing dialogues, comment on the content. Then focus on the achievements in the speech and then show the mistakes with ways to correct them. See, correction is right at the end. You can get them to use peer feedback here too and train the students for peer feedback which is, you know, it'll take time, but, you know, once they get it, it uh, they will really uh, roll on. The same thing goes on uh, with reading and listening uh, lessons as well. Feedback is something really important if you can, uh, for um, motivational purposes. It teaches so many things if you really uh, plan very well ahead of time. Now, speaking at low levels is, is a topic that's being discussed in our case because it's not the, um, the most important thing as we believe. I mean, it is important, but it's not the, uh, ultimately reading and, and writing are more kind of things we spend more time on. But we did some kind of research uh, years ago and a few years back. What we found out is the speaking was a top skill, the lowest level said they should be practicing. In the department, the first year students and uh, in the lowest level, level levels in our department. Why? Because people ask them, do you speak English? They don't ask them, do you read English? Do you listen to English? Can you watch videos? They say, do you speak English? When the family, mothers and fathers and whoever in, in their promise, in their homeland, you know, um, they say, oh, you've been, you know, studying English at Metu for two months now. Can you say a few sentences? I want to hear what it sounds like. But the students cannot say, oh, let me show you how I read. My reading skills are great. Speaking, as it happens, we ask these students, as it happens, speaking is the face of the language. Their, their, their whole um, language ability is, they can show it off by speaking, first of all. And they really want to do that. They are, in our uh, context, uh, all I found is, you know, all students are motivated to speak. But they are so delicate, easy to be broken. Uh, so we need to be very carefully designing the tasks and encouraging their confidence levels uh, because they're very self-conscious. They want to really do things right, the grammar right, the pronunciation right. So uh, they're really hard on themselves, aren't they? I mean, this, is, this part is really my observation. Confidence building practices, you know, as long as they can just convey their message, speaking is speaking. Um, appropriate practice activities just frequently in the classroom, uh, providing these would be great. Real speaking experiences outside the classroom, maybe EPELs. 
maybe certain projects might be helpful. Um, and getting them to think about not only their departmental needs, but personal future needs. Uh, why do I say this? Because they say, well, in the department, the instructor, just like in our case here the, in the webinar, the instructor talks, asks a quick few questions and goes away. So why do I care about it? Why would I do that? But of course, speaking would be necessary for them with for other purposes, like an Erasmus exchange program. If they were to go somewhere, they would use, need to use English. Doing graduate studies in a foreign country. So not everything is just the immediate future uh, in, in our department. It's personal. They have a personal future, maybe personal views, personal wishes uh, that they want to fulfill in the future, which re requires them to speak. Everybody would like to speak another different language. I'd like to speak French one day, but I'm very shy, really. <laughs> All right. We need to work on these fixed mindsets again and again. I'm going to show you a few others. Um, a few months into it, uh, a few, uh, one of my students said, I'm an engineering student, not a social studies student, so I cannot learn English. Do you think this is scientifically correct? No. Mathematical ability is linked with language aptitude. Um, although today, actually, there, uh, I don't know if they're working on language aptitude anymore, but uh, today uh, a lot of methodologists say, well, many people can learn languages no matter what their uh, tendencies are. But to this student, I had to, you know, say, find something uh, from literature, and the literature supports this. My strategy was freshman from engineering department. So I said, hey, you don't believe me? Let me see, let's see, you know, if they can use it, you make a decision. Can they actually speak English, learn English or not? Okay. Another student said, you know, Turkish people cannot learn English very well. Oh, this is so terrible. But they say this, you know? And this is, we all know it's wrong. There are many examples of Turkish people learning English extremely well. Some role models, like influential persons in society, academics, uh, students, actors, actresses, well-known people, sportsmen. I know some names, but I don't want to just, you know, uh, utter them here. Uh, you can pick and choose uh, from YouTube is gold is a gold mine. You can find politicians uh, speaking in great English, uh, old and new recordings, um, and you know they're unbelievable. And once they get to know these, I'm sure that they'll start to believe uh, believe it. Sorry, I clicked on something wrong. Another one. You know, we need to be in that country to learn English, which is which is. Makes sense, but not necessarily. I've known many people who've learned English perfectly well with very good. <laughs> Fatih Terim. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw Fatih Terim. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a, that's an example. Yes, but um, that the student would have uh, suggested that. But still, uh, there are there are very good examples. Uh, um, one name I just can't remember. The the. Uh, our champion, the billiards uh, champion, you know, I can't remember his name, but anyway, he speaks English very well. And he said he, he studied and learned uh, in order to uh, be able to understand the, the, the Olympics and what's going on in the sports arena. Uh, so he's got great speeches on, online um, in, in English. I was going to say Jen Yilmaz as well, but you know, some people have a reaction. Ha, ah, Semi Salginar, that's right. Yeah, you can you can uh, do a search and find great, you know, his his great uh, speeches in English. And of course, there's an TEDx as well, uh, TEDx talk in Turkish, and he says how he learned and why he learned English. He would be a great, uh, I think, um, role model. Uh, Jen Yilmaz has great English, but a lot of people don't like. Uh, him as a role model. So it depends. You know your own students. Uh, you have to pick and choose accordingly. All right, ways to interest them out of class. Well, find a hook. I was saying find a hook. Each student has a different 
way of enjoying language, how to use English now, not just to do exercises, not realistic, but not pedagogical, even for low levels, there are some interest areas for these students. What are they interested in? What would they like to do in English now as users of English? Um, some suggestions, watch game videos. Game videos are things that kids do these days. Um, they play a game and they record their own voice at the same time. And uh, they, they can do these in English too and have great fun if, if they want to do it. You know, they may, um, you know, if, if, they're, uh, if they want to do it on YouTube, that's great. Okay. Um, turn on, turn your phone into English and use Google Maps and try to get somewhere. Play games in English. Turn uh, the game uh, into English and play the game and follow the instructions like that. Turn your computer into English. Turn your phone into English. Watch videos in English. Right. Um, one of our beginner students created a blog. Uh, with lots of vocabulary and explanations and examples because he loved working on vocabulary. And a lot of his friends started to study from that blog. Um, work on translation. Some people just love translation. They can work in translation. Work on interesting vocabulary items. Watch and make videos showing how to do origami, you know, and teach things, skills uh, to each other in English. Um, <laughs> learn how to play a musical instrument in English. I mean, the learning part in English, not, you know, playing the guitar, an, an English guitar is not the idea. Um, how about in class? Well, we know these, I just wanted to remind them. <laughs> um, ways, uh, ways to interest them in class is, you know, use a variety of activities in class games, research tasks, videos, discussion, debate with another class. You can match them with another class and get them to uh, have a debate. Make assignments and tasks relevant to their current and future interests, you know, always current and future. Get them to give examples from their own interests. Get the students to socialize in class and out of class online. Uh, I wanted to remind this uh, because we take it for granted. They th we think they will do it on their own, but sometimes there are some shy students there. They might be left alone in front of the, you know, they're just at home and there's this computer, the, the screen and nothing else. So, you know, you can arrange them to actually get together, socialize and do things. Um, and after that, they will be really uh, socializing, hopefully. So as teachers, uh, Teachers are, are the sources of motivation. We need to show our interest in teaching and learning. We, this is the classic, so I kept it to the end. Meet the students individually outside of class hours, especially low levels. They will have needs. They won't know how to say uh, state the need. So it would be a good idea to keep, you know, individual meetings would be nice. Be compassionate, set a good example. Be careful not to demotivate the students and state clearly the reason for trying something out, a strategy, for example, why, Hojan, why are we doing this? They keep asking this, being 18 year olds. Explain them, that would be even better. They might even turn the task into a better one. They have great ideas. Work on the student expectancy of success, not failure. Uh, challenge them just enough and keep enjoyment of language as well as lessons in mind. So we come to in a nutshell. I'm wondering if I covered everything I said at the beginning. This was the short version. Teachers are the main sources of motivation and demotivation. The same motivation strategy may not be suitable for all. Different students need different strategies. Much of the learning happens outside the classroom. We want long-term motivation and as well as short-term motivational strategies. Um, I think I didn't mention the, the gender thing. Um, in one study, uh, they found out that uh, a, lot, a lot of the tasks address or attract uh, girls' attention um, and not boys. Um, 
I don't I don't know which book they were talking about or which what type of tasks. But I also I, I read a similar thing when I was reading about the portfolio assessment, when you get them to reflect and keep a diary, you know, about their feelings all the time. And they said this uh, the boys said they didn't want to do it. It was a little girly. I'm not, you know, this was a finding of the paper. I'm not claiming that. So they say, please keep things, you know, make suggestions to boys as well. Don't forget about them. That's why I said, you know, video making, games, um, and ask them their interests. We may not be able to guess their interests. It's hard for me to, you know, I have a son, he's just 10, but I wouldn't know what a 10, 18 year old might like. So we may need to ask them. So, thank you. I got a lot of the ideas from a state-of-the-art summary of the findings uh, related to motivation. About He summarized about uh, 200 papers. Um, I recommend this very much. Of course, I had a look at, you know, Dernier's book and everything, but you can find this online. Um, and you, I, I uh, underlined a lot of the sentences and said, oh, this is exactly what I mean. This is exactly what we're going through. So it was not only our context, but in many other contexts as well. So thank you very much for listening. I'm open for any questions or suggestions or comments. Thank you, Devnuja. Uh, if you have a question, you can either raise your hand or write your question in the uh, chat box. Uh, but uh, while waiting, um, I'm going to uh, raise a question if it's OK. It's not a question. It's more like a comment plus question. Um, you have mentioned that when your students come to the university, uh, it, it takes some time to convince them if you excuse the term, or persuade them that English is necessary. So uh, most probably they have uh, developed lots of negative uh, habits during their previous education or during their previous experience. Is it a good idea to, for example, spare one class hour and deal with this altogether, maybe in Turkish, some Turkish, some English, or should we wait until the student says, Hocam biz bunu niye yapıyoruz? Which one Both. would you go for? I would go all the ways that work. The first day you will catch what a few students and they will go, oh, but the others, it won't, it won't click. Um, I would, I would, you know, weave it into the lessons a week later, I'll, you know, I'll notice something and one of the students say, teacher, blah, 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 blah. They'll mm -hmm. make a comment and say, ha, huh, this is the right time to say this again. Mm -hmm. And um, after a, a certain uh, period of time, another student will say, I mean, they, they, the clicking doesn't happen if you, uh, you know, you just can't do it the first day. One hour, I talk about it, and everybody, I said, mm. everybody straight. That doesn't happen. Okay, in so my opinion, you, we can my have a, a one hour of uh, a psychological session, maybe a therapy, therapy, yeah. <laughs> and then whenever is needed, maybe go yeah. through the same steps again, try to yeah. convince them again. So, but the beginning point is important. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So it's sure. not a waste of time. It's a very good no, investment. No. Okay. It is a good investment, okay. but always keep in mind and, and let's, you know, teenagers can get us uh, angry. Sometimes we think, mm -hmm. oh, how many times have I told them? And they're not, a, they either they don't understand, they're trying to make me crazy. Mm -hmm. they, they're not. They just didn't get it the way we, we told them. It's just... They're okay. teenagers and they don't, it's foreign language, it bypasses them. Yeah. You know, they yeah. don't get it or they think they get it. That's the other thing. Mm. They, they, they say, I thought that's what you meant. I said, no. And you, again, you know, talk about it um, and you, you try to get them to understand. Well, they come from a very long, uh, should I say bad learning experience? So we cannot solve all the problems, of course, in one hour. They have so many 
uh, negative habits. By the way, um, you said that um, uh, we should not be uh, gender biased when we are uh, in, you know, dealing with our students. Uh, I totally agree. One point, I have two daughters, as you know, they're all, they're both grown up. Uh, my elder daughter is crazy for video games. So if you want to teach something to her, she's an engineer. If you want to teach something to her, you should definitely use video games. So it's not being a boy or a girl. It's all individual. I mean, some people mm. love games. Some people don't. So I think it's a very good idea to collect uh, interests from students, get ideas from students. Shebna Mojam wants to ask a question, I believe. Uh, can you please unmute yourself and raise your question yourself? Uh, I don't have any question. I just want to say one thing. Yeah, uh, sure. Thanks, um, thanks for being in this world. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You're, you're, you're such a lovely person. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being with us. And uh, well, uh, Devna Hojam has mentioned that this online thing is not as likable as face to face education. But you know what? Because of this online, virtual teaching. I have met so many lovely people. I had that yeah. chance. See? Like me. <laughs> yeah. uh, these, these people make uh, life better, more livable. Is there a word like that? I don't know. I have just created it right now. Okay. Uh, Matt Ojam says, how do you start your teaching process with students who don't have any background? So zero English. Okay. So how are you going to start? Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. And then I would, it depends on, there's another question. What if we don't know beginner level students native language? If there are uh, others, other uh, language speakers there, it would be uh, a little hard. You know, there you we may talk about in in two cases. What if they are just Turkish students? I would use Turkish quite a lot the for first days and talk about the the feeling of learning a language. And I would describe uh, a few of the feelings they might have because. Um, I would use English, try to use English as much as possible, and that might be enjoyable for the students, but for some, it would be like frustrating and it would, they might get angry sometimes, kind of frustrations. And I would talk to them and I would remind them a few days of this, see, I bet this is what I was talking about kind of thing, but not so fast. They would need a lot of training uh, a lot of classroom language from very simple, you know, every day I would try to teach two, three types of classroom language because, you know, there are hundreds of them actually that you need normally, but they need time. And I would go about like that. And then we'll, we would go into uh, strategies um, and I would have specific hours uh, for working with their, with their, um, I don't know, learning behavior the strategies, their motivation, what they, how they're doing, uh, this, this would be it. I mean, no background, some background really doesn't make any difference. Yeah. I would yeah. have to set them straight and start over. Yeah. Well, well years, we have... years ago, when I started learning French, uh, we were only nine people in the classroom. I had zero, well, I had some, like, je t'aime, you know. <laughs> Things that everyone knows. <laughs> That's my French too. Yeah. I'm per. <laughs> but when the teacher walked into the classroom, they, uh, I believe that here uh, French uh, teachers 
had just switched to communicative approach. So she walked into the classroom. She started speaking in French, but very slowly, not like talking to a moron or an idiot, but very slowly, not showing off. But we used our previous world knowledge to understand, try to understand what she was saying. So when she walked into the classroom and said, bonjour, we immediately understood that it's a kind of a greeting because that's all humans do. You know, when you walk into a place and there are people there, you greet them, especially if you're a teacher. But it's not like audiovisual method. So she also wrote it on the board. And she said, Jeez. bonjour, bonjour, without saying any other friend. So mostly like gestures, body language, meaning you also say bonjour to me, you know? That's so right. she, was, uh, she was encouraging us. You know what? If you want to experience this zero level learning, start learning a language, Absolutely. a new one. Go there, sit in the classroom, suffer. Yeah. That's how your students feel. And then you can learn from that teacher how to treat zero beginners. That's right. And you know, when you say, bonjour, come on, ça va, you know, you get into the mood. You get, ah, I'm speaking in French. Oh my God, look at me, you know. <laughs> Even exactly. one or two phrases, three phrases, cliches, they yeah. make you feel confident. Absolutely. That's why we keep saying communicative, 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 because you can encourage them to start using, I'm sorry, I took over the stage. Oh my, I, I talk too much. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. There is another, uh, but what I'm trying to say is you can imagine yourself talking to a toddler. Okay. That's right. Use a lot of body language. Use slower pace when you're dealing with zero level learners. But if you start speaking in Turkish, they will not speak in English, okay? They will get, they come from that background. So they will say- They do. They but, teach um, us in Turkish. Um, they want you to use Turkish, please teacher. It's really frustrating. It's very hard to follow you, hour on end, one hour, another hour. They're cognitively, they get tired. But once you start to speak English, um, they say it doesn't feel like they're using English. It's like you're doing as if mm. it's no longer, then they're not using English anymore. So you're, they're not learning English. They're studying a language like a linguist. Mm. So um, they, they, it's hard for the students. I mean, they, they say on the one hand, it's really hard to use English be as beginners in the classroom. On the other hand, but, but the true teacher should use English and should teach us speaking. Um, don't get us wrong. The findings say they would like to have speaking, but it's very hard to get them to do speaking activities in the, in the classroom. Uh, what if we use lots of pre-activities, Estoja? I guess so. What if we prepare these students so much that they can at least produce some set statements, some set cliches? How about that? Yeah. Because if, I, if you walk into the classroom and say, okay, now let's talk about the dangers of nuclear plants. Let's begin. No oh, one yeah. can talk about that. No, the challenge should be just appropriate. You know, yeah. if, if the challenge is too low, they won't invest their energy at all. And yeah. no effort. This, this, uh, we know it's not worth it. Yeah. If it's too high, it's frustrating. It's, uh, you know, and um, 
demotivating really yeah. it should be just right it should be uh and it's really hard uh, it's being a teacher is really hard it's just yeah. but talking, saying things is really hard. easy the, the you should do this do that should prepare your the, 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 their students for that coming task i mean you cannot expect miracles in the classroom you cannot just walk into the classroom and say now, now let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of <laughs> uh, urban life, you know. You can't. You need to prepare your students cognitively, emotionally, Absolutely. linguistically. Prepare. You know, give them lots of uh, brainstorm, maybe. I don't know, visuals, maybe. Maybe a short video. Maybe a clip, uh, you know. Maybe a song. Just bombard the, uh, the students so that they can... Hmm, okay, now I get into the mood. Yeah, okay, now whatever, I talk too much. Azra Ojam says, may we use challenging, creative, cooperative writing tasks in adult online classes to motivate internally, our, to motivate our students yes. internally, or should we change uh, according, all, according to all students' styles? That's a long question. It, it uh, is. If you want I guess to... you should try, I would say. I mean, oh, okay. you, you can't, of course, there are certain tasks which you would just use with all the students. Um, you can't, I wouldn't really spare uh, a lot of my energy to trying to fit into all the styles of the students each time I'm creating something. Um, uh, I don't know what kind of task you're talking about here, but you know, creative cooperative writing task would be one task I would definitely try for all. And then if they like it, you know, uh, they can take it up in a more loosely created task that I present to them. They can pick and choose the kind of tasks. But uh, from, you know, um, this, so it would be both ways, mm -hmm. you know, so that, you know, they can, uh, have a go, try themselves and see, um, you know, reap the benefits of this activity. And then another case would be for them to choose. The, some of the students who like doing this could do this and work on a project. And uh, I would definitely have other types I have tried. Other students would try maybe not this, but other things, yeah. other types. There's another yeah. question. Oh, yes. There's a statement there. Uh, yes. Matt Ojam says, in our fac faculty, there are two approaches among academics. One side says, never use Turkish. The other says, use Turkish time to time. Which side to listen? What's your opinion? Except for the certain one hour a week, maybe the first two months, it depends on what kind of class you have, of course. It depends on the, the context. I would use Turkish just to talk about um, the, the strategies, maybe, or, you know, the, the daily stuff. Um, but not to teach. Stuff. Not to teach, no. Mm -hmm. If you start to talk in Turkish while you're teaching, all that language, the classroom language, all the strategies, uh, speaking in conversational strategies and whatnot, everything will just go out of the classroom. Mm. They won't listen, I don't think. Mm. Uh, it just didn't work for me, let me say that. Uh, maybe I couldn't, I couldn't do, I've tried. I fell into this uh, thing, you know, sometimes I will use Turkish, but you will not use Turkish thing. Mm. I tried it. It didn't work out for me. I couldn't. Mm. Classroom management went down. Mm. I made a mess of it. So I said, no, I'm going yeah. to be strict. Yeah, strict definitely. One purpose only. Yeah. Um, and in office hours, outside the classroom, one-on-one, -on -one I use Turkish so that they can use. There are all sorts of, sorts of things they have to talk to uh, the teacher mm. and emotions and sometimes family stuff. Sometimes, you know, they need to, they need their own language. Yes, of course. And, you know, while they are doing pair work or some group work, they every now and then switch to Turkish. And that's OK. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, Mertocan, personally, I think uh, time to time, switching to Turkish time to time is a relevant term, uh, relative term. I'm sorry. 
So you may lose your limits and start speaking in Turkish because uh, it is easier, you know, it's our mother tongue. So I think we should also challenge ourselves. Oh, okay. I'm not going to switch to Turkish. I'm going to try to do this in English kind of thing because we need that challenge. Students do not challenge us. We challenge ourselves. And uh, we are models, you know, for our students. We are role models. So we look at us uh, and uh, they, I'm losing my pronouns today. I don't know what's wrong with me. They look at us and say, oh, my God, she can do this. If she can, I can too. Why not? Because I'm not an American. I'm not a Brit. I'm just a Turk speaking in English. Right? So let's create that role model for them. Years ago, I was teaching a reading class. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, my students did not have a really very good background. So what I did, I photocopied a, a page of, a, of an article in Time magazine. I brought the photocopies and I said, I want you to read this article very quickly. You have only five minutes and find, the, find all the city and country names in it. And they were in a panic and they were like, oh, my God, Hojam, this is horrible. This is so difficult. We can't read this. I said, OK, there's only one task that you're going to do. Find city names and country names. They did. They managed. <laughs> because you know what? These are proper names and they are written with capital first letters. So the clue is there. And some of them look like real cognates, you know. They managed. And I said, see, you can even read um, uh, an article from Time magazine. So it is, uh, uh, I mean, I believe as the teacher, you can create this confidence in them. So the text is not important. The task is important. <laughs> Find a task that is achievable. And when they achieve, they will feel successful and they will feel motivated. I hope. I hope. <laughs> <coughs> Anything else that you would like to ask? Otherwise, I'm going to say night night to everyone. Mato Jam, thank you. Thank you. You have uh, raised wonderful questions. Okay. Devno Jam, thank you very much for sharing uh, your research pleasure. and your observations with us. Uh, we have learned a lot. We, uh, we have learned things that we can transfer to our context and hopefully motivate our students <coughs> again. Don't forget that as the teacher, uh, our attitude, our posture, our uh, treating the language, everything <coughs> affects the student, how they feel about language. Absolutely. So yeah. put on a positive mask on your face, go for it. That's right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for Thank being you with much. us. Thank no jam. Thanks a million. And Thank hope you. to see you really next week. It. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.